A reading from A Chronicle of the Beginning by Father Daniel Sezoev. Now available from Daniel Sezoev Incorporated. An excerpt from the foreword. In the name of the holy, consubstantial, life-creating, and indivisible Trinity, the existence of the Church is the linchpin of world history. This fact is often forgot for the sake of fidelity to the ideals of scientific knowledge. Nevertheless, the fact remains, and unless it is taken into account, history as a discipline has no objective value. In this work, which constitutes a continuation of our book, The Beginning, a Chronicle, we will examine from this standpoint the ancient history of post-Diluvian humanity, as well as the history of the Old Testament Church and its relations with a world that had abandoned its Creator. This work is of an apologetical nature, and it is devoted to the refutation of the widespread errors of modern pseudoscientific mythology, which unfortunately are even supported by certain Christians. In analyzing sacred history, we must start by qualifying our stance on the latest scientific data. As our standard of truth, we adopt the teaching of the Word of God, understood as interpreted by the majority of the Holy Fathers. All theories that contradict this are considered guilty until proven innocent. In this work, we will also examine a number of recently invented theologumena that distort the Orthodox teaching on Holy Scripture. To give a systematic exegesis of the text of the Bible is beyond the scope of this work, If the Creator so wills, we will do so at a later date. This work will primarily concern those passages of the Lord's Word upon which unbelievers most frequently cast doubt. In this, O reader beloved of God, may the compassion of the merciful Lord aid both you and us. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? John 3.12 Chapter 2. Evolutionism and the Origin of Death Every defender of Christian evolutionism is faced with an impossible task, to reconcile the orthodox teaching of the origin of corruption and death in the world through the sin of Adam with the fact that evolution was in progress long before the origin of man, on the principle of elimination of the weak and survival of the fittest. Every Orthodox Christian clearly sees the logical incompatibility of evolutionism and Christianity at their very foundations. Indeed, if we accept as correct the statement that death is not the result of human sin, the need for redemption is rendered moot. Suppose we join the evolutionists in supposing that the world in its current state, wholly permeated with death, is perfectly normal. What must we then suppose concerning its creator? Either he is evil and created everything from sadistic motives, or else he is powerless to prevent anyone from distorting his design. Both these suppositions flatly contradict the faith by which the church lives and has long been condemned as the most pernicious of heresies, duotheism and Manichaeism. To both these objections of the Christian evolutionists, we respond in the words of wisdom. For God made not death, neither hath he pleasure in the destruction of the living. For he created all things, that they might have their being. Wisdom 1, 13-14 Let us examine how the self-contradicting orthodox evolutionists explain this. The most well-meaning of these Father Stefan Lyashevsky prefers not to notice the heart of the problem whatsoever. He exhorts his readers, Was there death in paradise? Then Adam alone was created immortal. But there is a widespread opinion that all the animals in paradise were immortal. Where does this idea come from? Where does it say this in the book of Genesis? And yet it does say this in Genesis 1, 29-31. And why stop at Genesis? Is the Apostle Paul not authoritative for Father Stefan? Father Stefan goes on to quote words that directly disprove his theory. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, 
I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Genesis 1.30 It is obvious to any unbiased person that this clearly refers to all the animate, higher animals, and not to the inhabitants of a paradise which had not yet been created, and in which, according to many of the fathers, no dumb animals lived at all. The creation of paradise is described in the second chapter of Genesis. Nothing in scripture suggests that the animal's subjection to man lay in the absence of a struggle for survival. Nor do the Holy Fathers teach this, but Father Stefan prefers not to cite them. From the above-cited text, Father Stefan draws a perfectly incomprehensible conclusion, and it was so. Consequently, prior to the creation of paradise, of which there is not even a hint in this passage, it was not so. Living beings devoured each other. The logic of Father Stefan is staggering. It turns out that prior to their creation, birds crawled. Then it was so, and off they flew. The light was dark before it was so, and so on. Absurd. Could God really not have preserved the animals he had just created without food for the few hours that passed before they were blessed? Could they really have appeared on the earth so hungry that they promptly began devouring their own kind who had not yet been vouchsafed God's approval? In the thinking of our liturgical theology, after the end of the world, paradise restored awaits us. Concerning this, we have the prophecy of Isaiah. The wolf also shall dwell with a lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with a kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Isaiah 11, 6-7 As it will be following the end of the world, so it was in the beginning. For God himself said of all creation, It is very good. Incidentally, Father Stefan is indeed nearer to Christ's teaching than other evolutionists. He found the courage to reject the fairy tales about man originating from animal ancestors, acknowledging his creation from the dust of the earth and Adam's immortality in paradise. In this he was not, of course, consistent, rejecting one thing only to accept another that is based on no less shaky a foundation. Far more consistent in his rejection of revelation is the position of archpriest Alexander Men. For him, creation is the conquering of chaos by the Logos, which achieves a conscious level in man and is focused on the future. Thus, struggle is the law of world-making, the dialectics of the establishment of creation. And in the world this is manifested in evolution. Clearly, for Father Men, death is the essential and original state of the world, and it leads to good. He deliberately confuses the providential work of the Lord with the creative, true creation, as the Church understands the word. For Father Alexander is limited to the initial occurrence of heaven and the earth, equated with the Big Bang, life, and intelligence. For Father Men, man is not the cause of death in the universe but was to overcome it. Death and decay, in the opinion of this theologian, were spawned by the rebellion of Satan. In confirmation of his opinion, he interprets the second verse of Genesis, claiming that the darkness upon the face of the deep was the action of satanic forces. But this understanding of this passage was already deemed heretical by St. Basil the Great in his Hexameron. This teaching is overt Manichaeism, which ascribes to Satan a might equal to the power of the Creator. But the ecumenical church, together with the venerable John of Damascus, hymns a Lord who has no one for his opponent. Our God is in heaven and on earth. All things soever he hath willed, he hath done. Psalm 113.11 All things, not merely what Satan allows him to do. He spake and they came to be, he commanded, and they were created. Psalm 148.5 There was no struggle or failure on the part of the Almighty. It is clear that the heretical inventions of Father Men are foreign to revelation. God indeed limited himself to the act of creation, 
for he created something other than himself. But he did not lose his nature. Hence, Satan could not have hindered him from creating the world according to his design. Orthodox theology strictly distinguishes creation when God manifested the full extent of his completely unlimited omnipotence. The world created as a result, in which all was very good, and providence, when he accomplishes his designs through the free will of his creatures. Confusing these various manifestations of the Lord's power leads to heresy, which rejects both the omnipotence and the goodness of God. Father Alexander falls into a still deeper pit when he attempts to create a sort of mythical universal man in place of the personal Adam, thereby attempting to reject the reality of the fall and of original sin. In confessing this false teaching, he needs no refutation, for Father Men falls under the anathema of the Council of Carthage. That whosoever says that Adam, the first man, was created mortal, so that whether he had sinned or not, he would have died in body, that is, he would have gone forth of the body, not because his sin merited this, but by natural necessity, let him be anathema. Canon 109. We will merely note that if there was no first Adam, there is no need for the second, Christ. We will refrain from further analysis of the work of Father Alexander Men, not wishing to repeat the excellent work of Archpriest Sergei Antiminsov, Archpriest Alexander Men, as a commentator of Holy Scripture, which sufficiently exposes the anti-Christian nature of this theology of chaos. For us, the fruitlessness and peril of attempts to reconcile evolutionary pseudo-religion and Christianity have become apparent. They inevitably spawn monsters of theology that undermine the very foundations of the faith of the Church. The above-cited theologians failed to notice that, in the words of Hieromonk Seraphim Rose, the state of Adam, the first created, and of the whole world will forever remain beyond the bounds of scientific knowledge, beyond the insurmountable barrier of the fall into sin, which altered the very nature of Adam and of all things related, along with the nature of knowledge. Modern science knows only what it is capable of observing and of rationally deducing from what is observed. Adam and the primordial world can only be known within beneficial bounds, from divine revelation or from the divine visions of the saints. There is, however, yet another modern evolutionary theologian who accounted for this fact and went to the opposite extreme. This is Bishop Vasily Rodzianko and his new book, The Theory of Decay and the Faith of the Fathers. On the very first pages of this work, we encounter the very odd statement for an Orthodox bishop to make. This world in which we live was not created by God. God worked no evil, but in this world, as we all know, evil abounds. Its source is not God, but the prince of this world. The author equates the fall into sin with the Big Bang and evolution with divine providence. It is apparent that this theologian likewise ascribes to evil a greater degree of reality than that for which revelation allows. For him, evil is ontological, though this claim is not made directly. For Bishop Vasily, even consuming plants is the fruit of decay, though this was established as the norm even before the fall into sin. The bishop blindly accepts evolution as a reality of the fallen world, though, as stated above, there is no proof of its existence. For him, even unmingled personalities and immunity are manifestations of sin, though even after the judgment personalities will not mingle as Chardin would have it, but will commune with God face to face. But for Bishop Vasily, the key concept is that of the eternal creation of all mankind in paradise in the person of Adam. He begins with the assertion that Satan has nothing in what is rooted in me, created by me, that is, by him, Christ God. Ergo, the world of the prince of this world, Satan, is not mine and not created such by me. 
The logical question arises, is Satan then uncreated? Is not his nature good in and of itself? Is not the very nature of this world very good in and of itself? Does evil really have substance? The bishop does not answer these questions, leading one to suspect him of Manichaeism. His statements contradict the explicit words of the gospel. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3. To the mind of the church, it is clear that evil lies not in nature, but in the perverse inclination of free creatures. As for so-called evil in nature, it is under God's authority and is sent to men as a remedy for their correction. It is called evil not in an inherent sense, for this is true only of sin, but in a figurative sense, as something that causes us sadness. Hence, these ideas of Bishop Vasily are unorthodox. In the bishop's rather original interpretation, the one who subjected creation to vanity is Satan. Yet, in the unanimous opinion of the Holy Fathers, St. Simeon the New Theologian, the Blessed Theophylact, and St. Theophon the Recluse, it was God who committed his marvelous creation to the infirmary for the sake of man, who had become stricken with sin. According to another unusual teaching of Bishop Vasily, the kingdom of God is before all ages and at the end of time, that is, outside of time and above time and outside of space. By what means, then, does paradise exist? According to this definition of it, which our author holds, a dilemma arises. Either it exists in God's eternity, in which case it and all its inhabitants are uncreated, or else paradise is located in a zone of created eternity, where the angels abide following their self-determination. But in that case, it is linked to space, albeit distinct from it, and a semblance of time connected with it, which no longer permits free will to waver, but enables it to mature in a previously selected direction. In both the first and the second cases, however, the fall into sin could not have taken place. For this is only possible for rational beings who live in time, which was made by the Creator specifically so that they could choose between love for God and love for self. Thus, prior to the fall of Adam, paradise could not have been outside of time, for man had not yet made his decision. Afterward, however, it may be held to have been in this zone, since after the redemption it is inhabited by righteous ones who are incapable of falling. The opinion of Bishop Vasily, however, is completely incongruous with and contradicts orthodox tradition. The key error of his grace is the teaching that the logoi of creation are identical to the creations themselves. Quoting Chrysostom's commentary on the word katabole, casting down from a height, which signifies the gulf between creation and the Creator, Bishop Vasily incomprehensibly infers from this his idea that all mankind was created in paradise. In the same way, all the words of the fathers who say that our nature was created prior to the fall into sin, or that the image of God was embedded in all men, from the first to the last, by the Lord's foresight, are understood by this theologian as confirmation of his concept of personal, hypostatic, existence of us all in Adam, the universal man. For him, the existence of mankind in Adam in the form of an impersonal nature contradicts the whole tradition of the church. This is the more strange in that several lines later he cites the words of St. Simeon the New Theologian, who explicitly disproves his opinion. It must be said that these fairy tales have no basis in the works of the Cappadocian Fathers. Naturally, there is no impersonal nature, and it is clear that human nature likewise exists only in hypostases, persons. But it by no means follows from this that all hypostases have existed from the beginning. In paradise, human nature was contained in two hypostases, Adam and Eve, from whom, as from a wellspring, all other people proceed, being of one nature with them, but manifested in existence 
only at the time appointed by God. For the Lord they naturally exist in his foreknowledge, for he himself lives outside of time. But it does not follow from this that all men pre-exist somewhere outside of time and are deposited from there at an appointed time. This is the heresy of Origen, condemned at the Fifth Ecumenical Council. By confusing the logoi of creatures with the creations themselves, Bishop Vasily veers either toward pantheism, declaring creation to be an energy of God, or toward the false teaching of Barlam, who claim that the energies, logoi, of the Creator are created. It is obvious that equating uncreated energies, logoi, with creation, and the opinion that we supposedly fell personally along with Adam in eternity, leads to an acknowledgement of some tragedy in the depths of the divinity, and to the statement that God sinned by his energies, or that he succumbed to madness in bestowing hypostasity on his logoi. This is of course the pinnacle of impiety. The heresy that energies exist personally in God was condemned at the Council of Constantinople in 1351. The whole theology of Bishop Vasily may be defined in the words of Vladimir Lossky, which he wrote concerning this theologian's triadology. Christian theology that is faithful to patristic tradition knows no jumps to super-logic. It continually places us face to face with antinomies, but always attempts to resolve them through discernment, which enables us to think and speak of the metalogical without violating the laws of identity, contradiction, and excluded middle, outside which human thought and speech are impossible. From the above, it is clear that any attempt to reconcile or unite orthodox theology and the theory of evolution leads to the spawning of monstrous chimeras that undermine the very roots of revelation. And no wonder, for evolutionism is not a scientific theory in the ordinary sense of the word, but an anti-Christian pseudo-religion of progressism. Any attempt to accommodate it is condemned by the words of the Apostle. What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? 2 Corinthians 6, 14-15 The evolutionists are far more honest than our unhappy theologians in their declarations. Christianity has fought, still fights, and will continue to fight science. That is, the theory of evolution which the author of the quote certainly considers science, to the desperate end over evolution, because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary, destroy Adam and Eve and original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. And if Jesus was not the Redeemer who dies for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. This testimonial from the enemy requires no comment, for it reveals the true goal of evolutionism with absolute clarity.